Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we're talking about Season 3, Episode 7, titled El Viejo. It originally premiered on November 7th, 1986. And you know what? This was supposed to be the first episode of Season 3. And it got replaced because of, John, as you mentioned, contract negotiations with Don Johnson. This got pushed to episode yes, 7. Don Johnson wanted more monies. <laughs> I don't know, Melissa. Is Don Johnson justified in asking for more money? Uh, Yeah, because there's no <laughs> show without him. <laughs> I guess it depends how much they were paying tough, question, though. though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did Don Johnson get more money? And if so, did Philip Michael Thomas get more money? Or did he have and to maybe, put out another album? Maybe he didn't <laughs> ask, okay? So you don't ask. If you don't ask, you don't receive. So... <laughs> <laughs> the writer of this episode was Alan Moskowitz, which is this was his only episode that he directed. He did do a number of Charles in Charge episodes, though. He also did a show called Out of This World. <laughs> now I'm going to have the Charles in Charge song stuck in my head all night. <laughs> The director was Aaron Lipstadt. Now, we've seen him twice before. He also directed Yankee Dollar and Payback. Before we get started, I can check in with going on each other's lives. And guys, we got a big one this week. A gigantic one this week that we can all have an opinion on here. Last week, some news organizations were reporting that there is an apparent attempt at making a reboot of Miami Vice with none other than Vin Diesel's production company. Who saw any of that sentence coming? Yeah, none of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's it's essentially the entire team that was behind the Fast and Furious movies, or a lot of people that was that was behind it. And this is what Variety is reporting, and I'll put a link in the show notes to this article. If you just Google Miami Vice right now, it is the top headline for anything when it comes to TV related. And this includes Chris Morgan, who has his own production company who has also written six of the fast and the furious movies now just take a step back and remember something there's more than six fast and furious movies that they had to say he wrote six of them that wasn't all of them also is that supposed to be like a glowing report that he wrote all six <laughs> he wrote six of those well, movies it's it's important to know which of the six did he do that horrible tokyo drift movie was that him <laughs> i don't think anyone wants to take credit for that one <laughs> no one's put their name on it <laughs> well we're in this weird era where all kinds of stuff is being rebooted netflix really kicked it off i would say where there was a whole bunch of reboots that were coming to Netflix and then those became popular. And now we're in this cycle where not just movies, but TV shows are being rebooted constantly. And this uh, this article documents a few of them, including Melissa, the CW debuting a new version of Dynasty. What? <laughs> where was I on that one? <laughs> Trying not to act like I'm interested in watching it. <laughs> I'll say first, before we get into a little bit more discussion about this, but I'll say first that I believe our official go with the heat stance on this is we are not in favor, although we could be persuaded depending on what the original cast decision is on this show and how much of it they are involved with. Because if you were to say Miami Vice is being rebooted and the new lieutenant of the Miami Vice is Don Johnson, I think we're all in. Oh, yeah, of course. Or even if... Phil oh, Michael yeah. Thomas or the ladies or the B team of any of them will not see though. But that's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> well, there'd have to be a miracle involved, but <laughs> that's a different story. <laughs> they could pull a Will and Grace who whose show just got picked back up where they're just gonna flat out ignore how that show ended like it never <laughs> happened <laughs> yeah i mean it got picked up and got two seasons before it even aired as i mentioned our official stance is we're not in favor but we can be persuaded depending on who's involved and what and how the original cast votes but i i do want to go around and ask each one of you guys your personal opinion on what this on what the potential of a reboot would be john what what are your thoughts on this i i have two main things that make me pause about about liking or being excited about this. One, I look at what NBC, what is successful on NBC currently, and you see Law and Orders, you see the Chicago Fire and Chicago PD series, basically all Dick Wolf stuff. When you talk about Miami Reboot, even though Dick Wolf was obviously involved in this season forward, he's not mentioned at all 
as being part of this. If NBC was going to do this, I would hope that Dick Wolf would be involved somehow. So that makes me a little hesitant right there. Then the other thing is that in the article, they talk about the shows that have been successful that they've rebooted. They talk about Hawaii Five O, And I just want to point out, Hawaii Five O rebooted by CBS. Dynasty rebooted by C, uh, the CW, which is half owned by CBS. My thought is, is that, well, CBS has done it successfully, but no one else really has. I just, and, and if I saw my point to on CBS that it might be because of the type of demographic that they get on that channel. Oh, well, also it, Netflix exactly. has done it successively with a lot with several true. different shows. True, so, true. But I know that's not traditional cable, but they have been with Fuller House. They have been up, they have picked up for, I think, almost a third season now. I think mm-hmm. they're going into. Yeah, but I think that differs because one Fuller House is uh is not the same it's an extension and i mean we're not talking about miami vice being a netflix or amazon show if it was maybe maybe i'd look at this differently but we're talking about miami vice possibly coming back it's still the rights are still nbc's it's going to be an nbc show well melissa you've been the fan the longest out of this group me and john are coming into a blind and we're still watching the all these all these episodes for the first time you've been a fan for a long time where do you stand on the potential reboot of Miami Vice? Um, I stand that I would not watch it unless it had somebody from the ret- to return from the original cast. It doesn't have to be Don Johnson. It could be I would be OK with Switek or, you know, the ladies appearing on it. Mm-hmm. I could get into that. I would I would give it a chance if it had the, the original people. It has to have the original people in it. That's the only way that I would get behind it. Other than that, I have no desire and it does not make me feel confident to have Vin Diesel's <laughs> <laughs> True. company. That's the Sorry. scariest phrase in all of this, I, right? I mean, I, lo- I, I like Vin Diesel. You know, I'm not going to say I don't. I watch his movies. He's entertaining. But please, uh, that does not sound like a good idea because there's a potential that he would put himself on it. It's not doing well. The ratings aren't doing great. Vin Diesel just all of a sudden appears on it. <laughs> no, I don't think that's a good idea. I know. But like I said. Yeah. Like we've said, it, I would only be behind it if it had original people. That's the only way I get that I would give it a chance. Yeah, and I think that that's where our official stance is as a show, that we're, we're not in favor. But if the original Vice cast members start to become involved in this somehow, whether it's just supporting it or actually being in it, then we're ready to give it a shot. Yeah. Well, I know we, we've kind of labored on a little bit about this, but we did. I wanted to make sure that we did have a good discussion about it. Because obviously it's very important to us. Yeah, it is. <laughs> More show than any other TV show that we've ever watched. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go and talk about this week's episode, which is done. It's Miami Vice Texas style. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this week we open up Texas style. <laughs> Does that mean big? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Castillo's talking to a, a, a nice Texas gentleman named Vince Wilson. He's from Broward County, which I had to look up just to make sure I understood correctly. That is just north of Miami, not in Texas. But that he is, looks like he's from Texas. <laughs> it's just north of Miami in the Fort Lauderdale, Hollywood area. And he's there chasing down someone named Mendez, which would be important because he does mention that Mendez is the person he's looking for while he's in town. And then mm-hmm. later they can't figure out why he was there and who he got killed by. That's a different discussion for later. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, he only talked to Switek for the, for the record. <laughs> yeah, Switek comes in. He's going to give him... Castillo asks him to fill him in with information. Switek and Vince go walking out to his truck that's on loan to him. Nice, big big rig switek is very impressed that he's got this big rig and he's just explaining to him that he's going to be an uh, undercover mule for mendez he's going to go trans he's going to be the transit the mule for the drugs later that night vince is meeting up with mendez at the docks and a boat pulls up and inside is mendez and he's like this fabio looking <laughs> i don't think the man wears a shirt the entire episode or not a whole shirt it's like i have a shirt but it needs to be open and it wouldn't be a real miami vice episode if it wasn't for someone with long flowing mullet with bare chest showing and then also a cast member who has been on a previous episode as a different character. Our DEA agent, Vince Wilson, was also our internal affairs episode from the Dutch Oven <laughs> by Fritz Bronner. And apparently he can park a 26-wheeler on a diving board. <laughs> I want proof. 
This deal with Mendez is looking real shady from the beginning. Mendez, they're talking, and Mendez leans into his translator. His translator turns and looks at Vince, and he says, Nice boots. It's amazing you can afford them on a cop's salary. Vince just gets this shocked look on his face as Mendez gets out of the way. Another man pulls a gun, shoots and kills Vince. They push him into the water, and we go to our opening credits. All right, my way. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so right. he did a dead guy real quick. Um, but I mean, you know, they, they mentioned his boots are fancy, and then they just kick him into the water. I mean, <laughs> what a don't waste! Even think him. <laughs> what a waste! Yeah, I know. Also, maybe he should have worked on not looking so shocked when they accused him of being a cop, and maybe they wouldn't have shot him. <laughs> he was like, "Oh my god, how did you know?" <laughs> did, did you guys notice that they never explained how they figured out he was a cop? Like, no, like, it's just the boot. No, <laughs> there's no discussion. Well, yeah, it was just he had some fancy boots on. Those are cop boots. <laughs> I don't know. He was pretty over the top phony, though. When we come back from the opening credits, we're on a stakeout. So it's kind of a stakeout meet. The the duo are meeting with someone named Rickles. <laughs> <laughs> and then the B team are watching and they're taking photos of everything. I do love the conversation between Tubbs and Crockett inside of the black Ferrari that's already been blown up. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> that Elvis is, isn't is feeling well because he ate a six pack and the rings ch- messed up his mouth. And he took him to the vet. He's such a good o- pet owner. Like, where do you find a vet that sees your alligator? Or is that a crocodile? I, never I, I was distracted <laughs> by the Bon Jovi kicking in. I mean, oh, I know. Bon yeah. Jovi, Steve Buscemi, and Willie Nelson all at the beginning. I mean, it must be my birthday. <laughs> It's all in one scene for you. <laughs> so yeah, let's yeah. set this. Let's set, set this up really fast. Steve Buscemi comes walking out. Young, really young. Steve Buscemi comes walking out, and he's gonna go with Crockett into the museum to go meet with Mendez. And you're right, the music starts to really ramp up. It's really loud, actually. It's like too loud for the conversation that's happening on screen. At the same time, they're in the black Ferrari, which they blew up in the first episode of the season. So like I mentioned, this episode is supposed to be the first one. So we're just going to pretend like that didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> when Crockett and Rickles gets up to the museum, a security guard comes out and Crockett actually stops Rickles from shooting the guard. He pulls his own gun. He takes him a hostage. He's going to use him as a hostage. That he's way he's safe. Him, yeah. 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 But I don't know what he, how he would explain it to Mendez once he got in there. Obviously he couldn't. <laughs> well, we did. Swear well, he didn't. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that security guard is our SWAT and weapons expert, who we've seen about oh. five times already in fights. He, he never oh. makes it out either. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> they always kill him. <laughs> You'd think he'd be trained better being former SWAT. And when they get the cop hostage, that's when Willie Nelson just pokes his face around the corner and cop says, beat it, pal. And then Willie Nelson just disappears into the night. He's like, eh, I didn't want any part of that anyway. <laughs> just an old man taking a walk. Now, for the rest of the episode, I'm going to refer to him as old man because we don't re- we don't get his name until like the last five minutes of the episode. So I'm just yeah, going to call him old man throughout it, the yeah. whole episode. When they get inside to do the Mendez meet, Mendez, of course, sees the cop and decides to change his mind and they run. Mendez and his translator run. The two guards stay, shoot at Crockett. They miss, shoot and kill the security guard, the person carrying the briefcase with the two keys that they, that this was a test set up for a Burnett deal, runs out the back door, drops the briefcase, and just runs away. Now, when they see all this, Switek tries to radio in to say, you should abort when, you ra- when he ran into the security guard, but they were in too deep. And then the shootout happens, the security guard gets killed, and then... Like, like always, Vice just screws everything up, and there's not enough people waiting in the wings to actually snatch anyone up. Everyone gets <laughs> away, security guard gets murdered, and they don't have the jugs or the briefcase either. Okay, but let's be real. It's all Tubbs' fault, because Switek says right away, like right when they spot the security guard, he's like, we should get in there. We got we gotta we gotta forget about it and just get him and then Tubbs like, no, we gotta let it play out. So this is all Tubbs' fault. <laughs> also, how does Tubbs have seniority over Switek? He's been there longer. Like, why is Tubbs the one making the yeah, decisions? No. <laughs> <laughs> like, what? <laughs> so congratulations, Tubbs. It's all on you. And then you don't even care. <laughs> So, John, I was like you. I was very happy to see Steve Buscemi and Willie Nelson right out of the gate. And these are two gigantic names in 
Hollywood. Yeah. So, I mean, let's start with Willie Nelson. Willie Nelson was born 1933, folks. I'm bringing that up because he has been making music since 1956, and he's still making music. He started, he's released his first records before our dad was born. (laughs) Okay. And he's still touring on all Palooza. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah so obviously humongous country singer not just country singer but part of that outlaw country subgenre that that came around in the 1960s he's acted in over three films he's authored several books a little more background he wrote his first song at age seven was in his first band at age 10. He was touring in high school with the Bohemian Polka as the lead singer. And then after high school, he actually joined the Air Force briefly, but was discharged due to back problems. He attended Baylor University for two years and worked as a DJ, but then dropped out to pursue uh, his music career. So he is straight out of Texas. <laughs> so he's known for being a big normal member legalization of marijuana and a biofuels activist something you might not know is that in 1990 the irs seized some of his assets claiming he owed 32 million dollars so in 1992 he released an album entitled the irs tapes Fooled by my memoirs, which was a double album, and the sales from that album plus what they sold of his assets squared the 32 million debt. Yes, somewhere Nick Cage is like, Man, I wish I could do that. <laughs> He's trying. Same with Wesley Snipes, 70 movies <laughs> yes. a year. <laughs> yes, he currently splits his time between his house in Maui and his ranch in Texas. His house in Maui, his neighbors include Chris Christopherson, Woody Harrelson, and Owen Wilson. That is so they are hitting that bong every night. Sorry, all Dude, I can think about yeah, is Owen they're Wilson. They're smoking so much weed. <laughs> you know that. <laughs> Let's get to Steve Buscemi, who until earlier today I found out I was pronouncing his name wrong. <laughs> <laughs> So he is an actor and director. We would know him from Reservoir Dogs, Con Air, Armageddon, Fargo, Miller's Crossing, The Big Lebowski. What you might not realize is that he also played a waiter in the restaurant Jack Rabbit Slims in the movie Mm -hmm. Pulp Fiction. Yep. He's also been big on some of the... He's been on some pretty big TV shows as well, being The Sopranos and Boardwalk Empire, as well as others. He directed... Uh, some movies too. Directed some movies: uh, Trees, Bunge, Animal Factory, Lonesome Jim, and Interview. A couple facts you might not know about Buscemi: In 1980, he became a New York City firefighter, and he worked as a firefighter for four years with uh, Engine Company Number 55. After 9/11, he returned to Engine 55 for several days and worked 12-hour shifts to help sift through the rubble of the World Trade Center. Wow. Uh, something else you might not know, uh, he was actually supposed to play the Scarecrow in Joel Schumacher's proposed fifth Batman movie, Batman Unchained. Walter, oh. uh, Warner Brothers canceled the project after 97's Batman and Robin flopped. Thank you, George Clooney. Wow. Wow. That would have been, he would be a good scarecrow too. Unlike that Killian Murphy guy. (gasps) (laughs) (laughs) He would have been fantastic. Don't you talk bad about him. He is a gem. (laughs) (laughs) I'm just saying, if he had played the scarecrow, you'd be like Killian Murphy who? (laughs) (laughs) As long as you guys don't talk about Tom Hardy, we're fine. Scratch your eyes out. (laughs) What I love about Steve Buscemi is that he's been in hundreds of movies, hundreds, including just random cameos like in Billy Madison, where he shoots the guy on stage. (laughs) He's the guy that has the list that Billy calls to make amends. Yeah, and he's like, he takes his name off the list, puts his lipstick on (laughs) after he does it. (laughs) The next thing we do in the episode is we head over to the precinct to listen into a recorded call. And Crockett is telling the scheme about Rickles and what the deal was that he wants to eventually move 50 keys, but this was just a two-key test. Obviously, things didn't go as planned. The DEA says that Vince is dead and that, that he was dealing with Oblivion, but they don't know who. Huh. Didn't, didn't Castillo find that out? Yeah, didn't they tell him a name hmm, and everything? Yeah, yeah, it's a Mendez. Okay. <laughs> Anyways. Well, there was some connection. 
I know. <laughs> or someone kept records. <laughs> Maybe if Castillo was paying attention, because that seems to be a severe problem now. He's done. <laughs> It's not like any of the Vice Squad was working on the case as well. <laughs> yeah, I know. The briefcase is missing. So that briefcase that was dropped is gone. Castillo is adamant, though. He wants the briefcase. He wants the two keys. He wants Mendez. So make this thing happen. But Crockett, meanwhile, he's still really distracted over the guard being killed. Because it's his fault. Could... So. <laughs> <laughs> also, how, how can Crockett tell that that was python skin and not like gator skin or something? I don't know. Well, pretty specific there. Maybe it's his Florida roots showing. Yeah, he's probably killed a lot of snakes. (laughs) (laughs) He knows what it looks like. We do have a short Willie montage. That's what I'm going to call it. I'm going to call it a Willie montage. (laughs) He has his own name. (laughs) Old Man Willie. (laughs) Old Man Willie. (laughs) He's the one that picked up the replay. Old Man Willie down since his... Sells his gun, the gun and pawn. <laughs> and old man Willie heads back to the hotel where he decides to go down to the pool. In his full suit, too. I'm not going to follow that up. At the hotel, you see the Mendez limo pull up and then one of his bodyguards, question mark, just decides to go poolside. That's not his bodyguard. <laughs> <laughs> And the ladies are there. They're working the pool. Now, they're also being worked by a couple of fat guys. <laughs> and they're sending yes. them drinks. And then Trudy's making jokes about it. Like, we have to finish these drinks and go up and talk to them. <laughs> She's trying to get Gina to drink both of them. Yeah. That, way they can, that way she can handle being with them. Yeah, I think so, yeah. <laughs> no, no. Not enough alcohol on this planet for that. <laughs> they also see, though, that old man comes up and talks to Mendez bodyguard and we hear the conversation where he says that he's got the briefcase he wants 10k and he wants to be done face to face with Mendez out at Crockett's boat Crockett is complaining about the duck boy not taking good care of his boat damn you duck boy (laughs) the whole time Tubbs is like trying to tell him like hey man it was just a security guard no one cares about security (laughs) guards yeah I know it's like no remorse like yeah it's my fault too but I don't have any remorse for that (laughs) you should have got a different job (laughs) while Tubbs is trying to say don't worry about one person getting killed Rickles shows up and Crockett starts to tell him we want to set the deal up again we're going to replace the briefcase but rickle says it's not about the drugs it's about the actual briefcase he wants that back but he still wants an- I, I another i love the very meet. threatening finger point you know um <laughs> he that was great point. so so like t- yeah so like tubbs is patting down rickles and, and and crockett stands up and just points at the other guy who's like <laughs> reaching for his gun and it's like oh better not better not pull your gun or else you know he'll he'll point at you some more He's a hard pointer. (laughs) He means it. Crockett gets a phone call and it's Gina. She's calling to tell him that they saw that old man has the briefcase. Then Crockett hangs up the phone and just tells Rickles to get lost. Yeah, get off. Take a walk. (laughs) Swim for it. At the hotel, the guard has called Mendez and he says he's going to take care of the old man. He's not going to see any backup or anything. He's not going to sit up to face to face. He's just going to take care of the old man. Inside, Trudy tries to do the old, I like you a lot. I'm also going to pickpocket your room key. But old man catches on to that real fast what she was trying to do was look at the number like she said right mm-hmm. she's like i got his number like she meant to do it that way so i'll be totally obvious <laughs> yeah yeah so she can see the gigantic plastic ring that's attached to that key which means like did they used to do that in the old day that's quite dangerous isn't it like you yeah. drop your key and it's got your number on it <laughs> <laughs> meanwhile the whole time he's trying to do that gina's trying to talk her way out of these two fat guys laying down some pork <laughs> she's trying to tell him she's a nun it you know, sounds like, an awful like they're pitching her to be in a porn like we want you to be yeah, we got we got spots for actresses. We need actresses. And then she's like, I'm a nun. And then they go to Trudy Nick. Are you also a nun? And she's like, no. And she pulls out her badge. I'm this. <laughs> Upstairs, old man's waiting around. The guard comes. He knocks on the door. He, the guard comes in. And old man's pretty upset. He's like, I thought I said this to be face to face. I'm dealing with anyone else. The guard tries to pull a gun on him. But old man ain't having none of that. Pulls takes, out his billy club. Yeah, or he pulls out his billy club, <laughs> handles him, takes his gun kicks he's like go on now get out of here scram <laughs> runs him out of the room scamp. just get out of here <laughs> and then he has the weirdest flashback ever 
He has like a flashback while having a heart attack of like saving the Alamo. It was the most Texas thing I've ever yes. seen. Flashback heart yes. attack. Dude, he, he's having a flashback of a John Wayne movie he saw where John Wayne was just massacring Mexicans. Not even him. The duo comes around the corner and he shoots at He actually shoots at them, but they get out of the way. Then he goes down. And they find that he's taking pills for nitroglycerin. I got it's pretty clear he's clutching his heart. I think us as an audience understand he's got a heart condition. Well, Tubbs is like a doctor at that point. He's like, oh, no, look, see? He opens it up. Nitroglycerin. I don't know. I don't know. Until I until they saw the pills, I thought he just had the or something. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, old man comes, too, and they start talking. And they're at each team or each person is talking a lot like they're cops. This is a cop conversation yeah, without actually saying that they're cops. They're both going after the same person. He's willing to help out, set the deal, but he wants his face-to-face. He wants his reward for, for the briefcase. The duo steps out, and then they have a very candid conversation in the hallway about being police officers. I know. Is, they think he can't hear because he's old? <laughs> Willie Nelson's in there with I, I don't his know, horn but... listening. <laughs> I don't know, but Tubbs, t- Tubbs ends up leaving because he's going to go get prints or try and get prints off of the gun. But the whole time he's talking to Crockett, he's got a handkerchief and he's wiping the prints off of the gun. <laughs> I that too. Also, can we talk about the guy like they thought he was having a heart attack and they didn't call an ambulance? No. They like laid him in the bed. <laughs> what the hell's going on here? Why were you going to lay? They laid him in the bed all creepily. Like, lay down, old man. I'm going to take good care of you. <laughs> When they leave from there, we ha- we have a quick stop over at the precinct where Castillo just signs off on having the old man help him. Old man, okay. <laughs> Check. <laughs> he also says that he wants the deal set back up with Rickles. And Tubbs just briefly mentions that Crockett wants to know about the guard. Now, no one's claimed the body, but Castillo says that if Crockett's mind's not in it, then he's off the case. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> He'll never take him off the case. It's not like, last, got- week, it, it's not like last week. It was any reason for uh, us to question Crockett's ability to, you know. Yeah, I mean, how long ago was that, really? You know? <laughs> it turns you out. Know. It, it turns out it was like six weeks in the future. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it hadn't even happened yet. So he didn't have any questions. That's why. It was a time machine. Back at Crockett's boat. Crockett and the old man are talking. They're going to head out and go meet with Rickles. Now, the old man is going to go, but not with Crockett. He's going to drive the caddy, and then Cooper and Burnett are going to go in the Ferrari. Now, there's a shot of Rickles calling Mendez to say to tell Mendez to inform him what's happening, that Cooper and Burnett are coming out. They want the finder's fee, and then they want to set up the next deal. Mendez just hangs up on him. He tells his guards, no deal. Just go kill him. And then there's this gun yeah assembly montage yeah, of them like getting ready taping stuff up it's like we're, what the hell is going on <laughs> <laughs> mendez is clearly pissed man that was his favorite briefcase his <laughs> lucky briefcase and he's just th- there's just no coming back from that so now also, um, update he still has no shirt on he's wearing a vest <laughs> but there's no shirt because it was in the briefcase <laughs> Maybe that's why he doesn't wear a shirt the whole time. Maybe the briefcase doubles as his shirt. (laughs) Credit to Mendez's men. They loaded up their giant arsenal, got in their van, and was able to figure out pre-cell phone days exactly what freeway the duo were on and what car they were they driving. They caught up with like two minutes. There we go. There they are. Got it right on the curb. There they are. And look, there's an old man driving behind them. Really close. Suspiciously like the old man that wants to have a meeting with us. Don't look at him, though. The van throws open the door and there's an auto gun mounted inside of the van and opens fire. Somehow misses the Ferrari. Not, not just misses the duo. Misses the Ferrari completely. Old man uses Tubbs his caddy to run the van off the road and then when they get them off the road and they're passed out after they crash and the people are passed out in the van old man's like so you want to kill him now he's like kill him he's still alive <laughs> and crockett's like no nah, we'll let him die a slow death uh, the, the, the whole time he's taking the caddy and he's ramming the van tubbs is looking back like not my caddy like <laughs> yeah. he's about to cry he was too he kept looking back and it wasn't like oh i'm watching to make sure that we're not gonna get killed he's like damn it that's my car my car i live in that <laughs> yeah i have nothing else <laughs> i don't have a fancy boat <laughs> And now the duo and old man leave straight from there and go find Rickles at a restaurant. And they just come in swinging. They drop everyone that's in that crew real fast. 
They got Rickles cornered. He's like choking on some cake at the he same was time. Cheesecake. Yeah. <laughs> you know how sticky that stuff is in your mouth. <laughs> you can't swallow it. <laughs> he basically says that Rickles isn't down with the finder's feet. That that's what is the uh, Mendez. You mean? Yeah. Sorry. That Mendez isn't down with the finder's feet. So that's that's what the problem is here. But now old man's like, no, I want the face to face in fifty thousand now for the finder's fee on this. They run Rickles. Now this is my favorite part. They run Rickles out, and Gina comes walking up the tubs and says, <laughs> and says to him, quote, what happened? Won't pay their bill? And Tubbs just shakes his head and goes, chumps. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's yeah. one of two times he uses chumps. <laughs> I'm going to go ask these chumps some questions. <laughs> and as you said earlier, Melissa, every time he says it, it gets better and better. Yeah, it's better. I mean, it gets better every time. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and no, nothing like, you know, Beating a couple guys up in the middle of a restaurant, you know, nothing strange about that. No, it doesn't draw any place. attention. <laughs> you can see all the people in the background too, just watching. Like, oh, uh, they, they just hang around, and talk afterwards. My question is, if yeah. they're not cops, then who the hell does Willie Nelson think the ladies are? Yeah, like they're hookers that just fall. <laughs> hey, these are my hooker <laughs> secretaries. They do all the dirty work for me. I just bring them along. You know, <laughs> it makes no sense. Who are they? Why would they come? Yeah. Like, I, what? Why would she watch him on the boat? What the hell? <laughs> Gina also does say, though, that they found out who the old man is and where he lives. So that's where the duo are going to take off to now. Really? Gina's going to really babysit Texas the Ranger. old man. <laughs> <laughs> and all I could think of when he said it, where the old man lives, for some reason, like the old woman that lives in the shoe. I was like, did he live in the shoe? <laughs> so when we leave from there, Gina's going to babysit old man at the boat. The B team come walking up and ask a man jump roping on the street. It's like, hey, you know where the Royal Hotel is? Meanwhile, there's a giant sign above it that says Royal Hotel. Also, that was like the biggest man jump roping I've ever seen. He was so tall. <laughs> How was he jump roping that well? So I actually looked up to see who that guy was. I'm not going to go into detail, but he was actually in a bunch of black exploitation movies. I'm going to have to go look that up afterwards. It turns out that the man jump roping is the manager. So he goes walking in behind the counter and he's going to talk to Zito and Switek. Zito sighting, by the way. Because we're going back in time. Yeah, yeah true. Very true. <laughs> While they're asking the manager about if there's any mail, who's this guy? How long has he lived there? This lady walks up and asks if there's any mail. And the <laughs> manager is like, no. And then Zwitek so slaps down. like, this is a warrant to go check out his place. And she's like, is that for me? And the manager's like, no, it's not. It's a warrant. These men are police officers. She turns and looks at Zwitek and goes, quote, with a belly like that <laughs> and then the manager's like maybe it's bulletproof <laughs> <laughs> yeah. then when, it, when you pan out and you see white tech he's just got this look on his face like darkness my only friend <laughs> <laughs> Poor Switek, they're all, they're, the writers are always fat shaming him making him wear those stupid pants that he wears that look too tight on him the duo shows up and they discover when they get up to the room upstairs, they discover that he's Willie the Texas Ranger. <laughs> really is. <no. laughs> they also find a bag full of equipment and everyone's having fun being cowboys. They're like, bang, 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 <laughs> with the guns and like put yeah. the cowboy hat on and stuff. <laughs> and Crockett seems to know a Dude. lot about Texas Rangers too. Yeah, he was like a total fan of like Texas Rangers, you know, telling everybody the history and and uh, how he wanted to be one when he grew up. But he's not from Texas, so no. But they do use the term "cocaine cowboy," which is fantastic. That they actually squeeze that into an episode. Also, he also mm -hmm. talks about the Texas Rangers in past tense. The Texas Rangers are st were still a thing then, and they're still a thing now. Yeah, they're still a thing now. Yeah. <laughs> They you are. Know he had have, you, have you ever heard of Walker? <laughs> <laughs> Don't even mix those two together. <laughs> Walking out of the hotel, Croc is still talking about like this doesn't match up. Why would a Texas Ranger be a cocaine cowboy now? This doesn't make any sense. You wouldn't need it for retirement. There's something else here. So they're gonna split up. Tub's gonna go find out about the people, the chumps in the van. I'm going to interview the chumps that were driving the van, <laughs> me and Castillo together. <laughs> and then Crockett's going to go talk to old man. At the precinct, Tubbs is talking to Trudy, and Trudy's saying that someone in the van gave them all the info before the, going into the surgery. Driver, the yeah. driver of the van. Yeah, so he just turned over all the information on what's happening. They go in and talk to Castillo, and C Castillo's like, let's bring in Mendez now because he's being charged for murder one. We don't care about the 50 kilos anymore. We got him. We can get him for murder one. So go bring him in right now and then arrest old man for possession because he picked up that briefcase and is holding it hostage, essentially. So 
arrest him for possession of two keys. Tubbs and Trudy actually. Meanwhile, kind of back at the boat, old man Willie is telling Crockett good old stories about the time <laughs> and he was firing a gun and then he raised that man like his son. So um <laughs> that they killed an entire game, a gang called the Ru Rujeros? I think so, yeah. Yes, they were smuggling guns in from Juarez. Like, okay, well, maybe this is true. Um, <laughs> well, I, clearly you didn't do enough because it isn't stopping. <laughs> Still going on right now, Willie. <laughs> Where are you now? <laughs> you know what? Maybe they did. They did it, and it was all in black and white, and he was flashing back to it earlier. <laughs> or maybe that really was John Wayne. <laughs> What's great, too, is when we come to the boat, he gets a phone call and he tells Gina to go take a walk. Like, yeah. I need some privacy, please. Go take a walk. No, he's a jerk to Gina. She's like trying to be nice to him. And he's like, go take a walk, lady. I got to do like, Okay, fine. You know, it's a small boat. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah, John, like you're saying, there's a story about the old Willie's best friend gets killed while they take down an entire gang together. And then he raises his son as his own. And Crockett calls him out for selling, the, for selling out his badge. And old man just says, the low road takes you where the high road can't sometimes. And Crockett just goes, eh, well, you there. know, I mean, I do it all the time. I so I have a Ferrari. <laughs> I am on a boat. <laughs> you own an alligator. <laughs> and I don't know where my kid is. So, yeah, I think maybe that's, <laughs> I think that might be true for Crockett. <laughs> so they're going to leave to go have their meet up with Rickles. They, they're getting ready to leave. They both stand up. And then that billy club makes a comeback. And he bashes Crockett <laughs> over the back of the head and knocks him out. He doesn't even apologize either. He just hits him. <laughs> Not only does he bash him over the back of the head, but he pulls his gun out like he's going to kill him. I know. What was that and about? Tubbs just saves him at the last second. Tubbs is able to fire and shoot him, but he still jumps in the speedboat and gets away. Tubbs wasn't that great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wily old man got the drop on old Tubbs. <laughs> <laughs> Tubbs and Crockett. <laughs> And where did that speedboat come from? I have no idea. There was no boat next to them before. <laughs> he just stole someone else's speedboat. That's right? his speedboat. That's that's Crockett's spe speedboat. But for the record, Crockett doesn't dock his speedboat at the same place. Oh, he that's right. That's boat. right. He docks it somewhere else. Yeah, so where did that boat come he from? He stole someone else's boat. <laughs> that it's damn dock weird. boy. Dock boy left the keys in the someone else's boat. <laughs> <laughs> he really isn't doing his job. <laughs> we go to the Royal Hotel next, and this is where coming up on the last scene of the episode here. Old man gives his badge inside of an envelope to the manager, and then he gets ready for battle, Texas style. The Mendez gang is arming up too at the same time. So we have this dueling like Miami versus Dallas kind of None thing. of them have shirts on. No. <laughs> <laughs> After old man leaves, the duo comes busting in with the B team. They find out that old man is gone. He's taking his guns, but he left his heart pills. It's going on a death march. It was the, and for the record, the, uh, the manager like kept, he opened the envelope, saw what it was that he had given him. He'd given him money too. And he like straight away, I think he called him and told him he had it or something too. Yeah, I want to point out old man. Willie is very good at hiding drugs. No one's found the two keys yet i know where are they <laughs> they've been in that room multiple times no one has found the two keys downstairs they find the envelope that he left with the manager it's got the badge in it with a note that said it's vince's dad's badge make sure to bury it with him and then there's the realization that oh snap old man's partner that sacrificed himself to save old man willie it was his kid that got killed in the very beginning which is technically willie's kid too because he raised him like his own so he's out to get revenge against the mendez gang for killing vince so something we all figured out <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah oh yeah that vince guy that d agent who was after mendez and got killed like that somehow a all for connected. some reason <laughs> he was yeah. a cowboy for no reason at all right because you have to be a cowboy to drive a truck no <laughs> okay or from broward county we all saw convoy we know how this works <laughs> you don't have to be any of those things <laughs> <laughs> mendez shows up in the smoky cemetery and the old man is running around in the cemetery too they're getting ready for, for, for their final battle this is where we go this is where we are for our last scene you also see up to the top right the smoke machine dumping out the smoke but we'll ignore that every cemetery is smoky okay <laughs> and nowhere else around yeah, there equip them all with smoke machines you can point to them <laughs> yes the duo shows up and they go into 
the obvious police surveillance van yeah, that what? has the police markings <laughs> on it yeah. parked outside of the cemetery. And they have to convince Castillo, uh, Crockett needs to co- uh, ends up convincing Castillo that he's going to go in because it'll be okay. It'll make sense why he's there. And Castillo's like, who cares about the old guy? You know, just, just yeah. go get Mendez. Just go get Mendez. Like, actually do your job. He's so done. Like, he's like, he's just done. He's in the top of the bridge of his nose. Like, oh my God, why do I, why do I have to work with these fools? <laughs> I'm starting to think it's not yeah. acting for the show it's he doesn't want to deal with don johnson anymore oh, and we yeah. saw an interview of oh yeah with yeah. edward james almost where he said that him and don johnson had problems on set the day because when he started working there they had like a big fight the first scene they had to do together and he said edward james almost said that they didn't talk for the for, like for the until the, sec- the second season they didn't even talk like as they actually he didn't talk to anybody. He said yeah. he never talked to anyone on set because of Don Johnson and him fighting. I think Edward James almost is just done with the city of Miami. <laughs> I think he's done with the show. So, yeah. Castillo stare might not actually be the Castillo stare. It might just be Edward James almost staring at Don Johnson like I effing hate you. <laughs> well, here we are at the final Somewhere moments of Philip the episode. Michael Thomas is nodding his head like yeah. yeah. He's like, yep. <laughs> Finally, someone said it. (laughs) So here we are at the final moments of this episode. Old man comes walking out in his Texas getup, spurs and all, chew in one corner of the mouth, (laughs) cigar. A straw. He walks out to meet Mendez. As soon as he gets there, he grabs Rickles, takes him hostage, and a shootout starts. He drops a couple guards. Crockett comes running up at the same time. He drops a couple people, shoots and kills Mendez, but Mendez gets a hip shot off as he's dying. That hits old man. And so now everyone's dead again, including the kid, old man, the entire gang. Everyone's dead. The vice team has arrested nobody. And in his last breath, Crockett is telling the old man, I'm a cop. And in his last breath, old man says, I know. And then he dies. And that's the end of the episode. And they did. Dead. One guy did survive. The van driver. So I would alive. like. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's saying that he went through uh-huh. surgery after he went through that. But, you know. <laughs> I, I want to point out that Willie, Texas Ranger, got off five <laughs> shots, five hits, five kills. <laughs> Badass. <laughs> It was yo. Know, the filming was great too because he has also those old. Point. He has those old Colt forty five guns, so it kicks off all that smoke when when he fires it. So the filming was cool. Mm-hmm. That's those- why the fog machine was there. <laughs> <laughs> so I also want to make note that the last Crockett says, "I'm a cop. I'm a cop," which was his last line in the meat fondler case <laughs> last episode. <laughs> True, it is now. And it always ends with cop with Crockett trying to explain that he's a cop over a dead body. Maybe the, Crockett needs to reevaluate what kind of police officer he is. <laughs> Maybe you need to lower your expectations. Yes. He's not a miracle worker, okay? He was dealing with a meat fondler. <laughs> you know, he ain't been right since the meat fondler case. <laughs> also, old man Willie was old, okay? He had a heart condition anyway. He wasn't going to last a day. He didn't even take his medicine with him. He's so forgetful. <laughs> well, let's go talk about this music because we have quite the music segment, actually. So let's go talk about this week's music. All right, John. We have we have a great music segment here. And I'm just going to kick it off with... Now, 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 now. Obviously, we have Bon Jovi's Wanted Dead or Alive off of the album Slippery When Wet to start us off in music. Unfortunately, this is the only time we get to hear Bon Jovi. I say unfortunately because uh, uh, as kids, I know me and Dominic were really big Bon Jovi fans. I think we actually had the Slippery When Wet tape that we used to play every morning going to school. You know, I'm actually surprised that so, Bon Jovi hasn't been in an episode yet. And I'm also sad that he's not going to come back because still, it's hard. How do you say you're not a Bon Jovi fan? How does anyone say they're not a Bon Jovi fan? It's like saying you don't like Def Leppard. Who says that? <laughs> Who? I want names now. <laughs> yeah. So Bon Jovi was formed in 1983 in Sayreville, 
New Jersey by members John Bon Jovi, David Bryan, Tico Torres, Richie Sambora, and Alex Suck. Their third album, Slippery When Wet, uh, spent eight weeks at number one and was actually pretty much when they achieved global recognition. So their fourth album in 88 called New Jersey would get equal success and they would just tour non-stop until they took a hiatus in 1990 which she sam and, and bon jovi would release successful solo albums around that time so it, they return and record in 92 keep the faith and then there would be a gap until 2000 when they would release the, the single it's my life and then the album and that would kind of be a resurgence and uh, introduce them to like a new generation they are by far like the rolling stones of our generation they're 30 plus years consistently at the top and if you were to ask anyone like here you go i'll set it up melissa who is one of the most who's among the group of men who are the most attractive right now john bon jovi yeah he Still. never stops being attractive. No. <laughs> so they released 13 studio albums. And so we're just going to go back and talk a little bit about how they got to be what they were. John Bon Jovi, which uh, actually his last name is Bon Jovi. It's just spelled with a G-I. John Bon Jovi met David Bryan at 16 and they played a number of bands together. By 1982, John Bon Jovi was at school and he was working part-time at a women's shoe store <laughs> and still trying to make it. Eventually, he took a job at his cousin's music studio, recorded a number of demos, one being produced by Billy Squire. Oh, wow. His first actual professional recording was a song called R2-D2, We Wish You a Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> on Christmas in the Stars album. In 1983, Then Unknown took a job at WAPP 103.5 The Apple in Lake Success, New York, making jingles for the radio station. And it, at that time, a DJ named DJ Chip Hobart and the promotions director, John Lastman, convinced him to put his song that he recorded, Runaway, onto their compilation album. The song would actually receive significant radio play, and eventually Bon Jovi would recruit David Bryan, uh, who would recruit Torres and Suck to form Bon Jovi. Now, at the time, John Bon Jovi recruited his neighbor, Dave Sabo, to play guitar. He never officially joined the band, but Sabo would later form the band Skid Row. Oh, wow. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> After Sabo would leave, Sook and Torres would recommend Sambora, who had toured with guitarist Joe, uh, Joe Cocker and had even auditioned for the band Kiss, as well as playing in the band Mercy. They would finally have their lineup together and they, all they needed was a name. So they decided to go based on a friend's recommendation with Bon Jovi, kind of in the same fashion as like Van Halen. Mm. So oh, they yeah, were almost Yeah. So, but they were almost called Johnny Electric. <laughs> <laughs> they released their first two albums, and then after mediocre success, they hired Esmond Child as a songwriter for their third album, Slippery When Wet, which is what broke them and made them just international superstars. They also moved to Vancouver, Canada for six months to record. Desmond Child, who came in as the songwriter for that album, he is also responsible for writing the Kiss song, I Was Made For Loving You, <laughs> Film Jets, I Hate Myself For Loving You, Aerosmith's Dude Looks Like A Lady, Angel, Crazy, and a couple other songs. He wrote Alice Cooper's Poison. He also wrote Ricky Martin's Livin' La Vida Loca. <laughs> wow. So he's just a hit maker. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, like, like I want to say like four or five of the big hits that we loved off of that album were written by Desmond Child. So um, kind of he kind of made them. So obviously they go on to release 13 more albums. Bon Jovi and Richie Sambora would actually buy uh, an arena football league team called the Philadelphia Soul. Bon Jovi has also acted in several movies, including Young Guns 2 and U571. David Bryan has co-wrote several musical shows uh one being memphis another one being a musical of the toxic avenger <laughs> yes 
<laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, Sam Bora, other than his solo work, he would also compose theme music for TV shows, Entertainment Tonight, and Insider. And, and his song, Long Way Around. I, I'm sorry, not his, he sang the song, Long Way Around, for Steven Seagal's movie, Fire Down Below. Oh, oh my God. Because... That's, that's the best thing he's ever done, then. Bon Jovi is <laughs> yes. interwoven. Bon Jovi, the band, is interwoven with so much of our lives. <laughs> Toxie, Steven <Yes>. Seagal. <laughs> I mean, it's just, the list just keeps going. Dude, which, by the way, that song, Long Long Way Around, was, was not only for the movie... Uh, Steven Seagal movie Fire Down Below, but was written by Steven Seagal and David <laughs> Pong, uh, Palm Chris. He didn't write it. <laughs> he, he wrote it. Uh, Torres is actually also an accomplished painter and artist. We're going to move on. I'm going to talk briefly about State of Emergency by Cactus World News. They're an Irish rock band formed in 1984 by Frank Kearns and Yone McEnvy. Their first release and best known song was produced by Bono, who makes an appearance back in my music. A little, um, a little charity released- work. <laughs> yeah, and released on Bono's record label, Mother Record uh, Mother Records. Their first album, 1986's Urban Beaches, produced three hits. Their second album, No Shelter, was shelved in 1989, and the band was released from their record contract. Apparently, they weren't hacking it. Ah, so, okay. At that time, most of the band members would quit. McEnvoy and Kearns. We try to keep going for a little bit, but eventually they would split as well. They would contribute to several other projects over the year, but nothing really a- anything we would know. 2011, they announced that they were reforming after 20 years, and no one really cared. <laughs> so, moving on. <laughs> no one said anything. <laughs> So the last song we're going to talk about is Fly on the Windscreen by Depeche Mode. If I don't get to everything with Depeche Mode today, no worries. We're going to talk about them two more times before we're done with the show. Oh, nice. So I love a little weirdo industrial 80s rock. You calling them weirdos? Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, we are. You guys have no imagination. Bon Jovi. No, I'm joking. Pe- <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> Pesh Mode is an English elect- electric band formed in 1980. The group consists of Dave G- Gahan, Martin Gore, and Andy Fletcher, uh, with Vince Clark also being an original member who but who left after the first album and was replaced by Alan Wilder. The band since 1995 has been a trio. Uh, Alan Wilder would leave in 95. They had a huge run through the 80s and, and a good portion of the 90s. They sold over 100 million records worldwide. They were originally formed in 1977 when then classmates Vince Clark and Andy Fletcher formed a Cure influence band called No Romance in China. <laughs> yeah, which surprise, a Cure influence band. Yeah. <laughs> You're talking so, my the best of my worlds here. <laughs> it's all coming together. Yeah. Push mode, the cure, all in one thing. What? No. After several different iterations of the band, they would bring in Dave Gahan. He would join after Clark saw him perform David Frickin' Bowie's Heroes <laughs> in a local scout hut jam session in 1980. <laughs> David Bowie, what is wrong with you? <laughs> He's the new Phil Collins. <laughs> He's the new Phil Collins. People are stealing his equipment. They're singing his songs, and he's in every single music segment. There was another David Bowie reference, too, later, but I skipped it. (laughs) I'm not going to say it. I'm tired of it. (laughs) The original band, they, they actually, instead of just recording demo tapes and mailing them off, they would actually personally deliver their tapes to record companies. And uh, actually said in the interview, quote, most of them would tell us to fuck off. (laughs) Eventually, someone would see the light and their first single, Dreaming of Me, would hit number 57 on UK charts in 1981. Their second single, New Life, would hit number 11 and then and get them an appearance on the BBC's Top of the Pops show. After that, their third single, Just Can't Get Enough, would be their first top 10 hit. So, like, almost immediately, they just came out the gate running. It actually wasn't until about 1984 
that they broke out worldwide when their song People Are People was used for the uh, West uh, West German broadcast of the 1984 Olympic coverage. Mm. After that, their, their music would leak out in the North America and the U.S., and they would just kill it from then on until about 1995. When, in 1995, after all, all the touring, Wilder would leave the band, basically say, like, I get no respect, so I'm leaving. Um, <laughs> at the same time, Gahan would be battling a heroin addiction and some mental health issues, to be honest with you. And <laughs> like at the same Bear. time, Who's in a bad place? Tell <laughs> Who's in a bad place? Let me tell you. He just wasn't doing well. We were all worried about him. <laughs> and Fletcher would actually leave a tour due to mental instability. Oh, wow. So, so the whole band's just breaking down. Yeah, whole band just kind of fell apart. Gahan would actually, uh, in the, within the next two years, almost overdose. And then after a stint in rehab in about 97, they would come back together and they would tour a little bit. And then they break, they would take a break. And pretty much from 97 until now, they've toured and released music periodically, but never in big, big runs. You know, they, they, they go around, they do a few tours and then they take a break. They get together, you know, uh, like in the 2000s, they got together, they released some new music, went on a tour, everything kind of fell apart again so and that's pretty much been since then i knew this is gonna be a big one because there's two giant bands and to say if melissa's a giant miami vice fan that goes hand in hand with being a cure fan and also a gigantic depeche mode fan yes they are touring right now mm. by the way they, they were just here like two weeks ago and i was like oh <laughs> <laughs> well let's go give our final thoughts on this episode all right, guys, I'm going to kick off this week on, a fi- on the final thoughts. This episode was, eh, it was yeah. all right. Yeah. I mean, it was Miami Vicey. You know, they. <laughs> it was Vicey enough. <laughs> <laughs> we had a new character and a, and a, and a, a true Texan, not. Crockett being a Texan in the episode Glades. Um, oh, God. We don't which... need to go back to that. That was bad. <laughs> <laughs> Willie Nelson was... Uh, he was there. He was all right. <laughs> it was Willie the Texas Ranger. So I mean, he did what he was supposed to do. I guess what, what it was is that... It, like I was saying, it was okay. It was my advice episode. It was pretty good. It was all right. I have no real complaints about it. There's a couple of weird pothole things, and it was, but all those are because they decided to move the episode from being the first episode of the season to being the seventh. So all the pothole stuff would have been fixed for me if they just would have kept it at the first episode but otherwise like it was okay the only way it would have been any better for me is if we would have got to know who had the hell mendez was we just never really find out about who this shirtless hunk of a man was <laughs> that is the dealer in this or the seller in this episode so yeah it was all right john what are your final thoughts? I, I think the first 15 minutes of the episode, I was super excited. I, I was loving this episode. I was down with everything that was going on. I loved Willie Nelson, the rogue Texas Ranger aspect of it. But by the end of the episode, I was kind of where you are. I was kind of like, eh. As the episode went on, it just kind of fell off for me. You know, and I mean, I, I think you're right. I think some of the plot holes with it kind of, you know, and then the lack of knowing who Mendez was. At some point, the hotel manager is going to find two kilos and be super happy. <laughs> um, I can finally get out of this dump. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, overall, I thought it was... It's a strong Vice episode. It, it just, it, it seemed to tail, trail off near the end. It, if it could have just held that same steam up for, that it built up at the beginning, man, this would have been my favorite episode of the season. Yeah, um, you know, it, it had flashes there that were really good. I, I'll, I'll stand by it, too, when I said that final scene, the filming of the final scene of him shooting those Colt 45s and the big smoke coming off them, like, it felt like a Western. Like, it was a good job. Yeah. Yeah, there were definitely aspects where aspects of the episode where I was really excited and I really enjoyed enjoyed it. But then there was a few parts in between there where it was, you know, it just kind of meh. So, Mosa, what what are your final thoughts on this episode? Uh, obviously, I've seen this episode before. This is not my first time watching this. This is not my seventeenth time watching it. I don't know how many times I've been through. <laughs> Nor will device. be your last. <laughs> no, it won't. No. <laughs> so, to me, this is an episode you have to get through to get to the good ones. So. <laughs> I don't like this episode. I'll be the only one to say it, I guess. I don't like it. It's boring. I don't like, I don't care about the Texas Rangers. I'm sorry. I don't, and I don't care that some old man ran out some Mexicans out of the town. I don't care. 
<laughs> and I don't care about Vince being killed in the beginning. I don't care about any of it. I'm like Castillo in this episode. I'm done. <laughs> I want to know why that why Mendes never wore a shirt and he didn't really speak English. Like I, that. I want to know why they hired him if he couldn't speak English in this thing. What's going on right now? No, seriously though, it's it's it's, bo- it's boring to me. I don't know. I guess I I'm. I didn't even care that it had Willie Nelson in it. He did not save it for me. So, uh, you, you know, it's funny. What's funny too is I, I want to say Mendez is one of our vice players, where he's played a few different roles in the episodes as well. Yeah, for sure. He has. To, he just looks like he fits the bill, right? We need some guy who's shady looking, kind of handsome, but he's got to be like smarmy. He's got an amazing mullet. <laughs> just checks all the boxes for Miami Vice. <laughs> I think Dominic's yeah. gonna go look up who he was after the show. <laughs> He keeps talking about his his curly mullet and all the stuff that went down. <laughs> well, that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Miami Vice and Go With The Heat. We would love, love, love to hear from you. Email us, goewiththeheat at gmail.com. You know what we would love to hear from you about? Not just this episode and not just your thoughts on Willie the Texas Ranger. <laughs> we would also love to hear about you on where you stand with this reboot. The potential My Vice reboot. Are you for it? Are you against it? What do you think of our position that we're not in favor unless the original cast start to come out to either be in support or being a part of the new show? Email us, go with the heat at gmail.com. Let us know where you stand. Did you know that you could find Let these? Let us know ep- where you stand. And should there be a Meat Fondlers episode? <laughs> Did you know that you can get this show on iTunes, Google Play, TuneIn, YouTube, pretty much anywhere you can find podcasts, you can get this show. Be sure to check out the website, GoWithTheHeat.com. You can click on About Us. You can find all the ways to follow us. You can click on Subscribe. Find all the ways to subscribe to the show. We appreciate you listening. We'd love to hear from you. And that's going to do it for us this week. And we'll see you all next time. Bye, pals.